the news agents. We are hearing today about a series of sex tapes. Yeah, you heard that right. Sex tapes featuring the Duke of York, Bill Clinton, Richard Branson, possibly even Donald Trump. The curious thing is, we do not know for certain whether these tapes exist, but they are part of a cache of documents that the courts have just released about Jeffrey Epstein and the island where young women were forced to have sex with very rich, very well-known, very important men. This is Sarah Ransom, who claims those tapes exist. They are videos that exist. The people that know they exist, I'm sure are very frightened of them being released. Epstein, him, Ghislaine Maxwell, amongst others, were regularly enforced that if I ever did come forward, myself and my family would be harmed. That was Sarah Ransom speaking on Good Morning Britain today, standing by her story. A few years ago, she withdrew the allegations, having earlier told the court that this sex tape existed and some of the behaviour, particularly allegedly by Donald Trump, was frankly horrific. But it has thrown open again all that went on in that island, the risks that these men took, the appalling exploitation of these young women, dare I say young girls, at what happened under Jeffrey Epstein. And it's still casting a long shadow today over people whose reputations are still more or less intact. Welcome to the news agents. It's Emily. It is John. And the allegations that have come out uh, in this cache of documents that have been released by the court in New York uh, that heard the whole Ghislaine Maxwell trial just show the extent. I don't know whether treasure trove is the right words to use to describe uh, the appalling nature of what went on at that island. But we have seen more evidence of more and more people spending quite a bit of time on Epstein's little adventure playground where men who were rich and powerful could get whatever their hearts desired. Yeah, and on today's episode, I guess part of our job is to work out the difference between a credible witness and a witness who has withdrawn her testimony because it's false or a witness who's withdrawn her testimony because she felt too intimidated to let it go out in public. So one of the debates we were having, quite frankly, before we started recording was whether we believed the stuff that we were reading. And so we're kind of sharing this with you because Sarah Ransom, who was, she says, around 22, early 20s, when she was forced to have sex, she's now in her 30s, she talks about her friend having sexual intercourse with Clinton, with Prince Andrew, with Richard Branson. Richard Branson in the last 24 hours has denied any knowledge or any wrongdoing about this. But she said that there were sex tapes that were filmed on each separate occasion by Jeffrey Epstein, we assume, without the knowledge of those involved. And she's talking about her friend, her friend being Virginia Dufre, who was the um, victim at the heart of the Prince Andrew affair. We know from plain records that both Sarah Ransom and Virginia Dufre were on the logs. They were on the island. We also know, of course, since the trial, the conviction of Ghislaine Maxwell, that Virginia Dufre was a victim of sex trafficking that has been proved in the courts. What we don't know is Sarah Ransom's own story. We don't know how much of this has been fabricated or how much of this she has felt under pressure to withdraw, even though she knows or she believes it is true. And this is why we're treading, I suppose, a little bit carefully in the discussion we had at our morning editorial meeting, which we always kind of you know, kick these ideas around, is do we ignore it because yeah. we cannot verify it ourselves? Or do we say, well, this is what we know and this is what we don't know. So we're kind of thinking that it's better we do, this is what we know and this is what we don't know. We don't know that everything that uh, Ransom has said is true. We know, for example, that Virginia Dufresne, some of her evidence has been 
proven to be wrong and she has withdrawn allegations. But we also know that a lot of it is right and has led to settlements and court cases and all the rest of it. And so you can't just ignore everything that is said and you don't have to believe 100 percent that everything is true to know that there were some things that took place on that island which were pretty damn heinous. And that is what we want to explore today. And some of what Ransom is talking about is the gagging, actually, of anyone talking about this. And I think we're going to explore in a moment that whole question of secrecy and the whole question of credibility. If you make sure that the women who you are abusing are never believed, then you keep the men in the sex traffic circle much safer. So one of the things that Ransom is saying is that her friend, we believe that's Virginia Dufresne, was heavily intimidated, was forced to sign a confidentiality agreement, was basically silenced into a place where she could never stand up in court or go to the police and say, this happened. And the person that we've gone to to help us understand this a little bit more is an investigative journalist at the Miami Herald. Why? Because the Miami Herald has been right at the centre of uncovering what happened on Epstein's island, Little St James, going way back to a series of reports they did in 2018, which eventually led, actually, to the arrest of Jeffrey Epstein. He was then imprisoned, awaiting trial, at which point he took his own life. So we know that the Miami Herald has followed this story doggedly and it is their investigation that has forced this latest tranche of papers to be released to the public. So Ben Weeder joins us uh, now on the line uh, from Miami. We have all seen this slew of papers that have come out as a result of the kind of court case releasing and the judge deciding these papers should be released. We should salute you in the process of all of this at the Miami Herald for the role you've played in getting them uh, released. How did it all come about? The Miami Herald has been fighting to have these records released since 2018. Um, I think, you know, the important context to think about is when we think about the broader Epstein story, uh, the abuse, um, the, you know, the sweetheart plea deal that he struck with federal prosecutors in the U.S. that that allowed him to really escape harsh penalty for, you know, accusations from dozens of girls that he had abused them when they were, you know, when they were children. One of the key components has been the secrecy. The girls were kept intentionally in the dark about the negotiations uh, for this plea deal that Jeffrey Epstein struck. So the Miami Herald's attitude has always been the transparency is especially important um, <clears throat> when you think about this particular situation, because secrecy was really part of the problem from the get go. Um, and so it has been this fight for years to get these documents released that were supposed to be public. They never should have been secret. The case was settled in 2017. The Miami Herald began fighting for these records to be released in 2018. And so, you know, our attitude and the attitude of our, our wonderful lawyers has been that these documents should have been public from the get go. And I guess, Ben, the question is, have you seen stuff that has really surprised you or shocked you in in the dump of documents that are now open to us? Obviously, the, you know, the, the names that are always going to get the biggest headlines are, you know, Prince Andrew, uh, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Bill Clinton. Um, and, and I will say I, I haven't necessarily seen things about those big names that have shocked me. But that's in part because, you know, we already know so much about those relationships and the accusations, particularly in the case of Prince Andrew. Some of the other names have surprised me, though. You know, we learned, for example, you know, one of the one of Epstein's victims talked about David Copperfield, uh, the famous magician sitting next to her at some point and saying something about, you know, hey, have you heard about how, you know, they pay other girls to recruit uh, to recruit and bring in other girls, you know, which seems to suggest, you know, a really detailed knowledge of the sex trafficking scheme that, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were undertaking. You know, there were powerful people who truly were aware of what was happening uh, and perhaps participated, you know, certainly in the case of Prince Andrew, that, that has been the accusation. You mentioned Donald Trump. And of course, Donald Trump is still so hugely relevant because he's hoping to become the Republican nominee for president, hoping to become uh, the pres president uh, by the end of this year. Um, yet there is the most lurid allegations against him not from the sex worker, but someone who claims to know the sex worker, who claims that there is a video of Donald Trump being unspeakable. Right. How should we think about those allegations? And it's challenging. I mean, you know, the way we've approached that is, you know, these are allegations that 
you know, this woman, Sarah Ransom, who was one of Epstein's victims, you know, later recanted. These came out of emails she had sent to a reporter at the New York Post. She rec recanted them in the emails or at least walked away from them. She recanted them later to us at the Miami Herald as well. Um, you know, on the one hand, I think, you know, it's it's in these documents and, and people are obviously naturally interested. And so, you know, it's important to acknowledge that they're there and not pretend that they're not. Uh, but I also think it's important to, you know, to make clear that, you know, she has said, you know, actually, you know, some of those things I made up. And, you know, I think the context I think of it is, you know, as a desperate plea by this by this woman to get attention for abuse that that, you know, she feels like the world has turned a blind eye to. Uh, I think that speaks to the attitude that a lot of uh, these women had, which was for years they felt like, you know, um, government officials, journalists, you know, the world had had really ignored them, had ignored what had happened to them. And, you know, and we saw Jeffrey Epstein, even after he re reached this plea deal, becomes a registered sex offender in the United States, you know, society still welcomes him back. And so, you know, I think that that it speaks to the desperation um, that these women felt. And, and frankly, I think it's important to, to keep in mind also, you know, the, the challenges that so many of these women have faced. I mean, many of these women were vulnerable to begin with, which is, you know, part of what made them, unfortunately, targets for, for Epstein and Maxwell. Just on that point. So if I asked you as a journalist, would you trust Sarah Ransom's testimony? I mean, if she was there with you, if she was telling you things, how how do you see it now? Because on the one hand, and I think you've explained it very well, there's a huge vulnerability to what some of these women have been through. And there is also the possibility that their stories were being shut down, that they were being silenced because they were scared to say things. I'm just, you're much closer, clearly, to some of this th th than we are. W would you call her a sort of a, a trusted witness? I trust some of the things she said. And I, and I think, you know, it, it helps in her case. It helps in the case of Virginia Jufre that there are records to back them up. You know, they appear uh, on the flight logs you know, uh, going to visit Jeffrey Epstein's various uh, various homes, uh, particularly his home, Little St. James, which is his private island in the U.S. Virgin Islands. There are photographs. In fact, uh, one of the interesting kind of developments in, in yesterday's release of documents was that uh, there turns out there were a number of photographs, some of whom, which included Sarah Ransom uh, with, with other women uh, in uh, one of Epstein's properties uh, that were released that then the court you know, retrospectively said, actually, we should not have released those documents. You know, we, we want to retract them, although, you know, by that point, the whole world, including yeah. us, had seen them already. I think corroboration is important. I mean, if you think about, you know, the most famous photograph associated with all of this, which which you know well, you know, the photo of uh, Virginia Jufre, Prince Andrew and Ghislaine Maxwell, you know, that story to me wouldn't have the same weight without that photograph. Right. Ghislaine Maxwell, Prince Andrew, Jeffrey Epstein, you know, in many cases have said, oh, I don't remember that person. I never met that person. When you have a photograph like that, it really does bolster these claims. I mean, I have uh, to so say, I, I have to say that, you know, Prince Andrew has always maintained that that photograph itself was faked. But just going back to corroboration and evidence, the fact that these names, these household names, these former presidents, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Richard Branson, Prince Andrew, were on the logs, on the flight logs, does that tell you it is almost impossible that they didn't engage with nefarious activities, with, with trafficked women for sex? Or is that a completely separate thing? It's fair to ask what they were aware of. I mean, you know, Donald Trump, you know, you know, there's a there's a quote from him at some point saying something about how Jeffrey Epstein loves beautiful girls and he likes them on the younger side. So there seems to be an understanding of, of, of some of what Jeffrey Epstein was up to. They might not have own, known all the gory details, but there was some awareness of this. And I think that's a fair question to ask. You know, it's interesting. One of the names that appeared in this round of documents is a, a billionaire American businessman, Ron Burkle. Uh, and Ron Burkle, uh, you know, had uh, appeared in, in, in Epstein's flight logs, went on a flight with Epstein and Bill Clinton, you know, and others. This was a celebrity tour they did in Africa. And Ron Burkle had said retrospectively, hey, I, I decided after flying down with them on the plane, I didn't like what was happening. Yeah. I thought it was really creepy and I was going to fly home myself and I didn't want to associate with that guy. Um, if Ron Burkle was able to reach that conclusion, you know, why didn't, you know, politicians reach the same conclusion? Um, I think that's a very valid question to ask. Ben, I want to ask you a question which is sort of less you as a journalist, but as a human being, which is something that I've wrestled with and Emily and I have talked about, is the absurdity of the risk that these very public figures were taking 
in doing this, and you've just mentioned the millionaire who flew down and th- thought, geez, I'm, I'm out of here. This is too crazy and too sleazy and too ghastly. Why the others didn't and why they were prepared to take these risks and keep shtum about it and kind of hope that they would get away with it because it just seems like madness. I can't understand it myself. I mean, I'm a fairly risk averse person. So the, <laughs> the yeah. idea of putting myself in that situation seems seems crazy. You have to think about the tremendous ego and sense of invincibility that, that many of these people feel. And frankly, that, you know, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell themselves clearly seem to have felt. Um, you know, one of the things I think about a lot when you think about the girls who were victims and you think about the people who were consorting with uh, Epstein and Maxwell and were part of their um, part of their, you know, their world was, you know, these girls in many cases, in most cases, were vulnerable girls. They, they many cases came from fairly poor backgrounds. They came from broken families. Um, they weren't going to necessarily be seen as credible. And one of the chief strategies that Jeffrey Epstein's legal team had taken, you know, the first time he was investigated was discrediting these girls and saying, you know, you're going to listen to these girls who, you know, have drug problems and have, you know, have been arrested for offenses before. You're going to listen to them over all these respected, powerful men. Yeah. Um, and in Florida, it worked. Ben, let me just ask to end, where do you see this going from here? Because it was the Miami Herald's work in 2018 that essentially those investigations that essentially led to the incarceration of Epstein. Can you see any more prosecutions, any more convictions coming out of what we know now? I think in the past to, to former prosecutors, you know, they describe um, how, you know, if you strip away all the famous names, you know, at the end of the day, this is a, a sex trafficking scheme, which is not that uncommon for, for prosecutors to look at. And from their perspective, you know, you've got sort of the people at the top of the pyramid. Jeffrey Epstein was arrested and died in custody. Ghislaine Maxwell was very near the top. Um, and so from their perspective, well, you know, you don't necessarily spend as much energy on people lower down in the pyramid. With that said, you know, I, I've always been very interested to know more about um, whether Epstein's uh, financial relationships could lead could have led to financial crimes. Um, and I think, you know, details still may emerge if there are more civil suits. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about this case, you think about this particular lawsuit where these court documents have come from, uh, the Jufre Maxwell lawsuit. Um, it was this lawsuit itself that led to some of the charges that Ghislaine Maxwell faced. Yeah. And so, you know, what I what I think is more likely is is that we might see some additional civil actions that come out of this, um, where you know a victim is suing someone for their role in this. Um, and and in the context of of that civil action, if if something comes to light, perhaps that is you know that is fresh material that prosecutors could go after. I mean, I should point out that during the course of Ghislaine Maxwell's uh, trial and the lead up to her trial, you know, the U.S. government did say the investigation is still ongoing, um, but it wasn't like I have an indication of, well, this is the next person on the line who would get arrested. But but to, to my mind, you know, we're learning more at this point from the civil cases. You know, last year, for example, uh, J.P. Morgan obviously was involved in a very big uh, civil litigation with a number of Epstein victims. And we learned a lot about how the bank had facilitated um, Epstein's abuse effectively because they continued their relationship with him for years. And, and frankly, we learned a lot about how Jeffrey Epstein operated and the sort of social currency he had. So, you know, to me, that's where I would be most, where I think we're, we're most likely to see additional revelations and, and perhaps additional consequences. And we it's fascinating. We really appreciate your work and your joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. And we've got a special delivery. Unfortunately, it's only come with a second class stamp on it. Special delivery. But Lewis Recorded. Goodall is in the studio uh, with us, and we're going to continue to talk about Lewis Goodall. I like to say Lewis Goodall in case at this point they're not sure who I am. Well, I'm still not sure who you are. <laughs> Too sure. How um, dare yes. you? Yes, we're going to continue to talk about... I'm basically your carer. I look after you every day. The post office is my carer, honestly. <laughs> we have to keep you off the streets to stop you getting into trouble. <laughs> Little street urchins like you. Um, should we continue with this conversation, or are we just going to banter back? I don't know. No, let's let's go on. Let's go on. What are we talking? So about? it looks like the government is actively considering legislation that would quash the convictions of all those who were prosecuted in the post office scandal. The scandal being the post office, not the sub postmasters and postmistresses who found themselves being. Uh, prosecuted for embezzling funds and all the rest of it because of a faulty software system, which would be an enormous step in itself, because then you would have the executive overriding 
the courts, which is something that in a normal constitutional arrangements, you would never have because the courts are meant to be independent. But so egregious is what has happened. That is now under consideration. Yeah, I think what's uh, extraordinary about this story is, and you were talking about it on the show yesterday, but the extent to which it has so quickly cascaded through the political system, despite the fact it has so slowly moved through the political (laughs) system for 20 years. It's like a glacier. It sort of is there forever and then suddenly melts. And I think maybe part of that, I mean, you know, some of this stuff has now been well rehearsed about the way that the drama has crystallised this and made people sort of really empathise with it, despite the fact that, you know, journalists had been writing about it for a long time. Um, But also because maybe actually different parts of the political system are very well aware that there is a lot of blame to go around. And you can kind of look at each part or each sort of the main three parties in, and sort of say that maybe they have a, some sort of vulnerability in some way. Obviously, the Conservative government has been in office for 13 years, 14 years, so clearly potential culpability there. The Lib Dems had their own uh, current leader who was responsible at one point for this area of policy. And you've even seen attempts from some of his political opponents to sort of point the finger at Keir Starmer to say, well, why didn't he prosecute? Or why didn't he stop the prosecutions when this was going on with some of the people involved? So very, very suddenly, it has just rocketed up to the top of the political agenda. Yeah, and I think the other questions involve not just what's happened egregiously to the 700, 800 um, postmasters, men and women, but also to the companies that were behind this and knew. I mean, we think they knew now. And we talked yesterday about how Horizon was the sort of brand name for this whole computer technology, but it was run by Fujitsu. Fujitsu, in brackets, a very litigious company. But one of the questions that's on the table now is whether Fujitsu itself should be having government contracts renewed. Mm. Do you do you go back to Fujitsu as a trusted brand after everything that's happened? And one of the questions was whether they were actually accessing the computer, the data of the postmasters remotely without ever telling them. And I think that casts Fujitsu in this whole different light. And in a way, you'd expect a very strong, a very categoric line from the government on how they're thinking about that company. And the nearest we had was the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, this morning, um, saying that they were still looking into how Fujitsu had acted. And if it is determined that they made a number of knowing mistakes, knowing being the critical word, there could be serious consequences. It feels to me like each time members of the government are coming close to saying something definitive and then pulling back. So you don't actually get any clarification from one 24 hours to the next 24 hours. It's just meant to sound like an urgency. I, d- I, d- I don't know that we're actually seeing the weight behind it yet. Uh, the impression I get is that the government knows that this is where we want to get to. This is the point on the map where we want to arrive, where all the sub post office masters and mistresses, they have been compensated. The people who are responsible for what the scandal that unfolded, they are in court and we want to have, you know, to be able to close this dossier. The problem is that every time they say this is where we want to get to, the civil servants say complicated. Mm. Mm. There's got to be process. And it's just getting from A to B is proving really, really tricky. And so you may know where Rishi Sunak wants to end up with this. But actually, how you get there is really convoluted. So the question I've been asked a lot on Twitter over the last 24 hours when I've been tweeting about this, and I'm quite interested to see hear what you two think of it, because I, I, I think I know the answer, but I'm not quite sure, is, is why it is that, going back to that point that I made just a minute ago about why it's cascaded so quickly, like the obvious answer is the drama, but then... There's been loads of commentary on Twitter going like, why did no one write about this? Why did it take a drama? But there was loads of journalism about it. Like it had been a story (laughs) for ages and ages and ages sort of running on. And then suddenly the drama crystallises it. But then the question is, why didn't politicians react to the journalism? Why are they reacting to the drama? And there's something about empathy. It's about the public kind of understanding and seeing it sort of in a dramatic form. It makes it really less sort of techy and dull. But maybe it's also something about the power of journalism itself now, that journalism is less powerful than it was, that it's more diffuse, that there are so many different, there's so much noise around and so much news around that people just don't notice as much as they would have done, perhaps. Let, say when thalidomide broke all those years ago, the thalidomide scandal, when I, Harry Evans was working I think on it, it, was it was also a big scandal. A, a, the truth came out in a drip, drip way. Yeah. So you heard one case and then you heard a bit more and then you heard 
heard a bit more and the, and you had to jigsaw the thing together. The point about the drama is you see a hall, a village hall full of 500 people and the scale of it is inescapable. And I think that is possibly harder with journalism where each story builds on another story, but you don't actually get that mass sum effect of it in the same way. It was always on page eight I, I rather than page one. <clears throat> I yeah. suppose the other way to answer that question is that it's not either or. The journalism that has been extensive mm. facilitated the drama. The dramatist is only working with the facts that have been brought exactly. out into the public yeah. domain. And therefore, it's not that journalism has got weaker. And I still think that journalism does have the power to shock when you see a kind of blockbuster investigation in a newspaper or a panorama or whatever it happens to be. I mean, I hate to play smoke, but your interview with Prince Andrew did cause a little bit of a stir. So there are things that I don't do think happen. you should beat yourself up about <laughs> doing that. Just whenever you need to raise it on this podcast, okay. please feel free. Yeah. <laughs> More praise to Emily Maitlis. Um, but I do think that journalism has that ability. I mean, you go, you talk about the thalidomide scandal, yeah. and you're you know you're going back to the seventies and Harry 60, Evans. Yeah. That was a time when there was ITV, BBC One, and BBC Two. There was no social media. There was no internet. Of course, newspapers did control the flow of information as well as the broadcasters. There was no citizen journalism that we've got now. There were no people with smartphones uploading their videos of whatever. So, of course, yeah, the environment now is that everyone is their own journalist. Everyone is their own and broadcaster. And there's so much noise. And there is so much noise um, that maybe it is that much <coughs> more difficult to break through. But I think that you know what's interesting is that we as a podcast are doing news differently than maybe we were two or three years ago do you know what it's so funny over the christmas holidays we were watching the insider which is this story of you know journalism taking on um the tobacco industry in mm. the us and the whistleblower who works right at the heart of the tobacco company coming to cbs is 60 minutes and saying i'm going to tell you the story and how cbs didn't run it because it's a corporate conflict of interest and it struck all of us as a family watching that that would no longer have the same power that mm. you know a 60 minutes program does not have the power to shut down a whistleblower by refusing to wear it you know because that whistleblower can go anywhere and in a way that is a fantastic thing you know we shouldn't beat ourselves up in a way if the alternative is that People can, it is democratised, you know, information's democratised, the stories that we tell are democratised, yeah, you'd want them to be fact-checked, but it's an amazing thing that you can say, actually, that there will never be a cover-up in that way again, I think, because people can tell their own stories now. This is so interesting, because so much has changed, and there are certain aspects of coverage in the newspapers today where I think so much remains the same yeah. and you're seeing that the daily telegraph conservative leaning newspaper and conservative supporting newspaper writing an editorial today saying why didn't keir starmer do more about this when he was director of public prosecutions uh well because he didn't have any responsibility for the, for post, the post office, office. <laughs> whatsoever because they had the power to uh, implement private prosecutions so it was not in his purview I mean, we should just pause at that point and just I mean sometimes we forget how utterly arcane this country is oh yeah that the post office could create its own I, I, its own law yeah. unto itself of convictions and that we're still debating whether that should be overturned today it is madness it is absolute madness and it's something that has completely passed me by that the post yeah. office had the power yeah. to introduce private prosecutions. I thought that anything that went before a court yeah. had gone to the Crown Prosecution Service to see whether there is a case, and then you bring the prosecution. And you think, my God, this is unbelievable. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. But you have Keir Starmer under attack today. You have another story about the other dodginess of Keir Starmer in the Sun newspaper, the dossier that showed that he defended axe killers and baby killers and whatever else. What's an axe killer? I don't know, someone who it's kills awful with Awful people killing yeah. eggs. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's just, and you just think this is the playbook I've seen in successive gen general elections of the right-wing newspapers that going after a Labour leader who is popular and seeing whatever you can throw against the wall and see if you can make it stick. But this is just a little foretaste of what's to come. I mean, I think it's been clear for a long time, and we've discussed it before on the show, that um, one of the weird dynamics at play in the election is going to be you've basically got two principals, Starmer and Sunak, who are in so many ways quite similar. And Starmer was chosen to be a kind of 
answer to Boris Johnson, the Johnson, the yin to Johnson's yang, the sort of you know quite sort of stately, calm, maybe slightly boring technocratic guy. The Conservatives have resp- replaced Johnson with a version of Starmer, and actually in lots of ways politically they're not a million miles apart. And so one of the consequences of that is that when you're not having like quite quite profound kind of systemic arguments about policy and politics, you end up going pretty dirty and personal. And that is, despite the fact you've got two guys who lots of people would say, the, the paradox is, is you've got two guys who have their own integrity, have probably more integrity individually than some of their predecessors, and yet we're going to probably end up going down a road which is quite dirty, quite personal, and they start on both sides. And this stuff about Starmer that we've seen in the sun today in particular is just a little foretaste because before we've seen what Johnson has said about you know Starmer and Savile from his period as DPP yeah. now they're starting to focus and CCHQ Conservative Central Office have a, a dossier they've been working on for a long time of the like 20 years worth of cases that Starmer undertook when he was a defence lawyer a barrister and they think they've got lots of material and likewise Labour are going to go on Sunak's period yeah. in the city and all of the deals and money he made then Before we move away from the post office story completely. Paula Venels, CBE, CBE, has just announced that she'll be handing back her honour. Um, she will no longer be a commander of the British Empire. I guess she saw that position a million people had signed saying why has she still got it and thought it was easier to get rid of it herself than wait for somebody to call upon. Like I, think, I think what is interesting about that and I thought what was very interesting about David Davis on the show yesterday him not calling for that yeah. because it's too easy to think that the government has got its scalp and that probably Paula Vanell, you were talking earlier, Emily, about the jigsaw. I mean, she's one piece in that jigsaw. There are a lot of other people as well. And to be fair, like, it's the thing that will literally make the least difference totally. to anyone's life, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. right? So an easy thing to call for and probably a pretty easy thing to give back. And don't pretend for a moment that that's going to sort out the... British miscarriage of justice. Well, it, is, it doesn't. Well, right? the sort of comparison could be with Fred Goodwin, right? So Fred Goodwin, who was a knight, he was at RBS, he was one of the faces of the financial crisis, sort of Britain's chief banker. He ends up, because of the huge uh, sort of crisis in 2008-9, he hands back his knighthood, his knighthood was taken away from him, I can't remember the exact process, but in the end, he lost it. What happened to Fred? I think he's wherever he is yeah. now. I think he's fine. And like no one yeah. ever went to prison. It's, as, kind of, as a, result it's of a fairness crisis. thing, isn't it? It's the yeah. British sense of fairness. Right? Yeah, it's symbolic. So you but take that. It's symbolic. So it's symbolic. It gets you nowhere. It yeah. gets you nowhere. And for the, you know, will it make the, the all those post office managers and people who ran their post offices feel happier? Maybe a tiny bit, but they're looking for justice still. And that is not the end of it. I mean, and you'd do exactly the same. If you were Paula Venels, however much you loved your CBE, you'd just be like, I don't want anyone at my door. I don't want anyone. Oh, I'm going to keep my CBE. <laughs> no matter what happened, it'd I mean, never hide it under back. the bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm still waiting for a, a British safe. Empire medal. Yes. Or, yes. you know, <laughs> kind of that's the... I, you are out. the British Empire. I, yeah, yeah. On, the new, on the day the New Year's honours list came out, my really award gutted. came to me because my daughter gave me a Fitbit for Christmas that I'd got my first Fitbit award, my first Fitbit fitness award because I'd walked 10,000 no steps one or something. Can ever, ever. Uh, take, take that, that away, away from, from, from me. Yeah. So I'm, I've been honoured yeah. by Fitbit. Yeah. Sir John of Fitbit. <laughs> Sir John of Fitbit. So we want to big up a certain Gabriel before we leave today's podcast. And unusually for us, it's not our senior producer, Gabriel Radas, although just love never far from... Is he, is he a senior producer? I, I, I say that to keep him happy. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. Haven't noticed. But there is another Gabriel who's creeping into quite an important place in the French consciousness right now, and he is the youngest ever Prime Minister. I think we have to start calling him Gabriel at this point, Gabriel Attal, who has come from the education ministry to become France's prime minister. You'll remember that Elizabeth Bourne um, basically lost the confidence over a very similar sort of question that Macron was fighting as the one that Rishi Sunak was fighting over immigration. And um, at that point, Macron, the president, would never actually lose his position, would never step down. But Elizabeth Bourne um, lost hers and Gabriel has come in. And I found this beautiful phrase from uh, a Macron advisor, um, part of the Elysee team, who was talking about the reshuffle and said, after six and a half years, Emmanuel Macron wants to, these are his words, close a cycle, put his semicolon, to give his decade in power a breath of fresh air by changing the tone as one might do in a musical score or a poem. 
What a black accent's that? It is a French <laughs> accent. Emily is, is doing a French accent. I was the Sounded school. a little bit Lancashire. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, my accents, t- my accents tend to cross big bodies of water and end up sort of at the bottom. You of know what's going to happen now? In yeah. post-production, Rory is going to put piano accordion music. We're going to end up with berets on our heads. Ooh, I bet Gabriel just revoices it in his own French accent. <laughs> anyway. No, Gabriel would come in and say, why haven't you done it in French? And exactly. you'd get us to do it in French. Why don't you know what a semicolon is in French? But I guess the question is, what would our poetry be? What would our... If what you about were, us? Are you, no, a, a UK Prime Minister. Oh, a UK Prime Minister? UK setting. The Wasteland? <laughs> <laughs> that was too easy. Uh, honestly. You, Dolce de Coromest? No, UK Prime Minister would never admit to doing poetry because he would be seen as oh, yeah, yeah, arty yeah. farty. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to be seen like you're an hey, intellectual. The only one they do the, but the Prime Minister's one, got a new no, poem. The only one that's acceptable, the only one acceptable is If by Rudyard Kipling. Yeah. That's the only one that's acceptable. That's what they'd say. You know. You know uh, my that, theory. Like, Starmer would be like, you I ask my myself theory. every day. No, that's if the you point. can be a man, that's the you point. will be a man, my son. Men of a certain age and predisposition, if they quote one poet at you, it's, it's Ki- always Kipling. Kipling. Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether this, podca- I don't know whether this podcast has been a success or a failure, but we will treat it as the imposter that it is. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 